Good evening. Welcome to show number 69, um, In Harmony with Nature. I'm your host, Shalom Mandeville. Um, this is being pre-taped on the 21st of November, uh, 1989. And my guest today, once again, for the fourth time, is uh, Gilbert Van Rijkewaarsal. He's a well-known um, underwater photographer in Nova Scotia and Maritimes. And recently, uh, he supplied the entire footage to a um, National Film Board um, uh, documentary known as Rivers to the Sea, which uh, was nominated for the um, Gemini Awards, which will be uh, broadcast on when? On, uh, um, on CTV Network on the December the 5th. On December the 5th. No. So let's see if you will get the award, Gemini Award. You know, that's a great honor. So uh, today's uh, topic is uh, saltwater experiences, and um, we will um, document the fascinating experiences in the underwater environment of Nova Scotian coastal waters, and uh, and also the kelp forest of the North Atlantic. So uh, I invite you to watch the show with commentary by Gilbert. Thank you very much, Mandeville. Uh, shalom. It has been. Uh, a great pleasure uh, to be on your program and um, in this uh, sequence I intend to uh, show the adventure of scuba diving mm -hmm. in our waters and uh, we are here in uh, Cape Breton um, and uh, there are two friends of mine and we went on a uh, on a dive trip that took us about a quarter of a mile out in a shallow bay, um, and at first we, uh, we were swimming in about 15-20 uh, feet over um, uh, eel grass, and uh, that is the habitat where you find the, uh, the bay scallop, which is, uh, which is being held up here. Um, scallops are... Uh, but uh, are in the interest of um, uh, divers uh, around Cape Breton and the uh, south, uh, the um, uh, eastern shore in Nova Scotia, where uh, scallops are quite uh, prominently uh, in every bay, and um, you have to have a scallop license to uh, uh, to bring them up, um, and it's fun. Uh, to, you have to have a purpose to, uh, to go down there. You can look around, but um, when you are looking for something in particular, then you start seeing things because um, you have to... It's uh, just amazing how your mind uh, is not uh, as uh, easy in its perceptions of things when you are down in the underwater world. Of course, you, you, you have your own safety uh, foremost in your mind, but then you are at ease with that because you are uh, uh, experienced um, as a diver. Otherwise, you, uh, you wouldn't be there going. Um, and then you, uh, once you feel comfortable, then you start looking around and uh, you see the different uh, forms of uh, life that, that live in the... Um, uh, in the waters, uh, in the in the bays, and in the open Atlantic. Here we are coming uh, from the eelgrass area into the kelp uh, area, which is uh, uh, usually a little bit uh, offshore, probably about a hundred yards or so. And then the kelp starts coming. Depends where you are. But uh, kelp is a is a large um, weed. Uh, uh, one of a variety of um, uh, weeds that, that we have. Um, we have uh, Irish moss, we have uh, dulse. Uh, some of those uh, plants are um, uh, used, um, they are harvested, and uh, um, carrageenan, for example, is, a, is an agent that is used in ice cream. Um, it's, it's used in, in production of uh, beer, for example, um, as a, 
uh, coagulant for protein. Uh, but in its natural habitat, the kelp forest here, you, um, uh, you see these uh, uh, branches and long uh, leaves that are up to 12 feet in length, and uh, they are uh, in this uh, aquatic environment. They, the, the weight is not there, so the, uh, um, they, are, they are almost weightless and um, they grow in all directions. There is no uh, particular direction that you have on, in, on, on land uh, with the trees growing straight up. Uh, that, that is not so in the underwater world. But you see here the patterns, that are interesting patterns on the, on the kelp leaf. Um, mm. It's about uh, a foot uh, wide, such a leaf, and it can be uh, eight feet long. And uh, it's in turn um, colonized by other um, weeds, depending on the age of the kelp. Some, some of it is an older stand, other is uh, more recent growth. Uh, it's the habitat of the lobster. Um, it gives the uh, it gives all creatures protection. And uh, when you swim through it, you uh, you find all these. Uh, life forms in their habitat and uh, it's particularly uh, fascinating to dive in amongst these uh, um, plants. Uh, our kelp is, uh, is big um, but then on the west coast they have the, uh, the giant kelp which grows uh, 40, 50 feet uh, kelp forest. Um, but um, uh, it grows quite uh, deep also, as deep as I've been, maybe about a hundred feet, uh, a little bit more than hundred feet. Uh, and then gradually life, uh, the, 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 this kind of life, uh, plant life disappears because it needs, still needs uh, uh, the sunlight uh, to uh, assimilate. Um, it's uh, the, the, in the bay is the visibility can be, uh, uh, particularly during the winter time, can be very clear, um, but also uh, the visibility can be less than um, uh, 15 feet, uh, you know. And, uh, but here we're coming into another um, area of interest, uh, which is the shipwrecks. And uh, this diver is coming down uh, the anchor line uh, from about 40 feet below the boat, which is on the surface, uh, uh, the anchor line is attached to uh, a famous wreck uh, in Shutterbucker Bay called the uh, the Arrow, which was an oil tanker that uh, struck Cerberus Rock in the center of Shutterbucker Bay in 1970, and uh, the uh, this uh, huge. Uh, uh, steel structure is sitting on the side of this um, reef and uh, we are going to explore this wreck. Uh, it's the atmosphere um, and the, uh, the mood that is uh, really thick there. And in the beginning you have to get used to, uh, to that, but um, it's, um, as you can see here, he here we are down in, in a site where the ship uh, broke up. This is the uh, this is the broken uh, opening where you're looking into the into the uh, uh, hull of the ship. The other part of the ship, the the bow section, is about a quarter of a mile further on uh, in a different location on the same reef. And uh, here you have the jagged metal and the uh, um, pipe. Uh, uh, things that belong to uh, to the function of a ship, um, to the to this tanker, and um, we are uh, swimming through it. It's just an, an amazing um, sensation to to be uh, weightless and move through this uh, eerie world, you know. And uh, we we were using flashlights uh, we were because we were going uh, into the wreck and. Um, uh, so uh, the light is um, 
um, quite subdued, but you get used to it. And uh, actually, the uh, the video camera that I use uh, is not um, needing uh, any more light than um, uh, than uh, natural light. In this case, it's artificial. We are looking underneath that structure. But you can see how it's covered with, um, these are sea anemones that are um, retracted. When they blossom, then they are in a catching position and look like flowers. Um, but uh, as you um, explore along the uh, structure, you can see evidence of the uh, incredible powers that um, were um, in force when when the ship struck the rock, you know, um, it was just amazing that this huge tanker uh, found the one spot in the bay uh, where there was a, a shoal and uh, ran full power into it. And here you see the uh, the crumpled up uh, um, underside of the hull, which um, which was slid up below and uh, from which the oil. Uh, boiled up to the surface. Uh, as it is clean now, there is no no evidence anymore of oil. Uh, there may be some oil still in sight, but uh, um, it's doubtful that there is much of it left. Uh, the uh, Navy divers um, went there uh, shortly after the, um, the disaster happened, and they uh, removed the oil from the wreck and then they blasted some of the uh, superstructure with dynamite so that it wasn't uh, a navigational hazard anymore so the uh, ships can go over it uh, although the site is uh, well uh, uh, indicated for uh, as, a, as a site where there's a big wreck but here you see uh, the so-called dead, dead man's finger sponges we, we have a number of uh, sponges that are particularly uh, characteristic for for the fauna, for the flora that we have uh, on our uh, in our waters that all have colonized in this nutrient-rich water in the middle of uh, Shirovaka Bay. All kinds of sponges uh, that are growing over the roots of the kelp. Uh, over structures that w once were functional parts in a uh, um, in a uh, ship now have uh, become uh, an artificial reef. Mm -hmm. You know, here we have one of the uh, staircases going up the uh, the bridge, and then we uh, we moved underneath there inside the uh, um, the rooms that were there, uh, where you can see the uh, controls of, uh, of the equipment, uh, where the oil, in this case, where the oil was, um, would be uh, loaded into the ship. I don't know the proper term for that, but uh, here we have some uh, faucets that would bring in uh, steam to uh, lift to make the oil more liquid. Here we have a gangway uh, on the side of the ship. There was another gangway on top of that. And uh, my, my friend was uh, coming from the other side to, uh, with his light to, to show the, uh, in perspective, the uh, impression of this um, uh, particular location on the rack. And then the under, um, against the ceiling you see uh, there isn't much space. Everything is grown over by um, sea anemones, no, mostly in there. And the kelp is hanging on the sides. What's a sea anemone? A sea, a sea anemone is a, uh, is a creature that lives stationary. And uh, it has a, a blossomy, um, a blossom-like exterior which uh, which is a catching apparatus with which it catches planktonic creatures. Mm -hmm. And when it has done so, then it retracts and digests them. And then it opens up uh, when it's hungry again. 
and when the water is a bit uh, rough, uh, then it's, it's staying closed. Um, I see. Um, yeah. What part does it play in the aquatic habitat? In the food chain? Um, in, the, in the food chain, but it lives off, uh, off planktonic creatures. Mm -hmm. Plank the planktonic uh, plankton mass is mm -hmm. the, uh, the most um, prolific mm -hmm. food that is that's around in the sea. It lives, it so what it kind of uh, habitat uses then for food? Well, you, you find uh, sea anemones, in, I think, in, in all depths in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not doesn't need particularly light. Uh, it needs sites where there are nutrients for, for, of it, from which it lives. And they're eaten by some of the, uh, some of the fish? Um, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, I have never seen um, uh, sea anemones being, mm -hmm. being eaten by, by it. It's possible. Are they edible? Um, in Japan, uh, they they have a, a, a variety of uh, anemones which are known as a as a uh, specialty delicacy. Hmm. It's possible that someday we will grow sea anemones to uh, uh, supplement our food. Uh, no, they are very prolific in the in the ocean here. Yeah. Hmm. And here we are going down 90 feet to the bottom. Where the uh, uh, the keel of the ship rests on the is in in the ocean floor, and uh, you can see here the bow of the ship and an anchor line coming down, and then uh, you see the uh, the rudder, giant rudder, and uh, the propeller had been taken out um, some months after the uh, um, the ship sank. But we are coming uh, uh, towards this. You see this this. Uh, um, you see the lights coming there. My my friend is swimming around it, and he's coming through it to give you an idea about the proportions of uh, of this rudder. Uh, the water there was rather cold. Um, usually, when you go colder, you you come to a slight thermocline. The warmer water is towards the surface, and then you you uh, you get a sudden uh, change and often there is a haze hanging there and that's the thermocline and then you come into the clear cold water of, of the Atlantic uh, but we were wearing dry suits or uh, wet suits in the summertime it's uh, you can be there we, we, we were all wearing um, double tra double tanks mm -hmm. and uh, that would last for uh, to dive down there um, for about 45 minutes. Uh, here you see the prolific life that uh, is growing on the rudder of the ship at about 90 feet, mm -hmm. 80 feet. Uh, these, th these particular uh, uh, sponge formations are, again, the dead, the dead man's finger sponge, uh, as they're called. And here, we're going up to the along the side of the ship to towards the deck again. You have only so much time that you can stay uh, at at the uh, deeper side, and so you have to avoid uh, getting into the decompression um, limit, so that you can, without decompression, uh, go up to the surface. And uh, we try, you try to avoid that, you know. When you're doing commercial diving, then you uh, you want to stay longer there, and then you but then you have to be backed up by additional tanks at different stages to uh, to come out. Here we have uh, uh, one of the portholes that is so covered with sea growth that the other divers have not noticed it. That some of the many of the other portholes have been taken out by uh, by divers who like to collect those things. And here we are on deck again. You see the equipment uh, of the tanker. Um, there are many of those uh, structures on the deck. Uh, for each hold, there you have a set of uh, faucets and um, uh, loading um, Again, they are uh, covered with uh, sea life. And you see on the deck uh, little uh, prickly 
cushions, which are the sea urchins. And uh, this would be a thing that you pull out, and you would be able to check how much oil there was in the uh, in the tank. And then here you have the steam piping, and uh, just everything is covered with um, uh, with this beautiful plant uh, colonization. You know, very colorful to uh, to see that. Um, It's a it's such a fascinating sight that um, I think it's probably the most interesting shipwreck that we have on, on the entire coast here. Yeah, and uh, my friend there is uh, using his underwater still camera to uh, record the uh, different features of the wreck from which he's going to make a multi-projector show later on and uh, to tell people about it uh, in, a, in a different way of what, uh, what such a shipwreck is like. Here you see a starfish and a flatfish on, the, uh, on this uh, structure. He's using an a, a underwater flash unit which brings the color of the um, of the location back. It, it will then reflect all the colors of the spectrum of light, which uh, in the natural situation with the uh, with 40 feet of water column over you, most of the warm colors have been absorbed in the water column. So when you bring flash, then you bring the whole color spectrum back and you get uh, everything reflects the colors that uh, that we that we see on the surface that you don't see uh, down there that much you'll see some but uh, you'll see them more bright when you uh, when you're using the uh, uh, the flash unit many uh, parts of the wreck course, where uh, conglomerations of, um, of apparel from the ship um, that, as it broke up, became a tangled uh, mass of, of items, some of it uh, sort of uh, shifted and um, uh, is lying a little bit on its side there, as you see here. I wouldn't be able to, uh, to say what that was, but um, one of the um, outstanding facts of, of this wreck is that wherever you show your, your lens, you know it is a ship. Many other wrecks are completely disintegrated by the tremendous forces of the Atlantic. Here we are um, in an uh, inshore fisherman's trap, which could be off Peggy's Cove in this, in, or off um, anywhere in St. Margaret's Bay. Uh, this actually was not St. Margaret's Bay, and this particularly uh, very interesting creature is a sunfish. A sunfish is a creature that lives off jellyfish. Mm. Uh, the only one that I know that lives off jellyfish. Uh, and it's a large fish, and uh, it swims rather slow, and uh, it has a sort of a coarse skin, um, which feels like sandpaper almost. Very tough, uh, and it would be very, very easy for sharks to get it. But apparently, it's not very tasty, so they make it up here. But they are often seen in the summertime by yachtsmen, by fishermen, and uh, get themselves invariably trapped in the uh, inshore fishermen's nets, where you where they can be quite a nuisance, um, but it's just part of the uh, of fishing to let the let these creatures out, and uh, uh, they are not uh, hurting anybody, and uh, they are just uh, fascinating to meet as a as a diver because you can get close up to them, you can stroke them, and you can see how uh, uh, how they. Uh, 
live and, uh, and you can see their appearance otherwise you would never see that you mm -hmm. know it would be nice if we had a, a public aquarium uh, on the uh, Halifax waterfront uh, where such creatures could be kept and everybody would be able to see how uh, what types of unusual fish we have here you know this is a summer visitor only uh, during the month of late July, August, and then they disappear again. Uh, they swim down with the Gulf Stream uh, in southern direction. Uh, at that same time, you find all the leatherback turtle. Um, it's also uh, a fascinating one that you occasionally hear of when fishermen catch them. Usually they let them go, but um, uh, in this net there were other fish like uh, you have a lumpfish here, and uh, a lumpfish is um, comes in um, shore to spawn, and uh, the the row of the lumpfish looks like caviar and can be treated to almost take like taste like the real thing. Lumpfish caviar, and uh, you saw just mackerel swimming by there. And here is another uh, fascinating. Um, uh, opportunity in the uh, in, in the sea you can meet these fish and uh, here we have um, a monkfish which is or devil fish or uh, angler fish uh, he has a variety of names uh, all because his looks uh, have created uh, myths of uh, scare uh, and uh, because he just looks like a, a monster, a, a big head with, with, uh, with fins behind it, you know. But uh, the creature is very um, uh, docile uh, once it knows that, uh, that you're not hurting it. Uh, before that, you can be bitten because he has uh, inch-long teeth and a lot of them. Hmm. But once he is, he'll, he'll eventually become so docile that you can stroke him and, uh, and play with him like this lady is doing. And uh, it's no, not dangerous. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating experience to um, interact with these creatures and uh, just get to know them. And, uh, uh, you know, if you uh, coexist with them peacefully, uh, you will be rewarded by the Excuse me, Gilbert, we're running out of time. I thank everybody, you know, to watch the show. And I invite them to watch the next two shows, which will be about um, Halifax Harbor and Bedford Basin underwater photography by well-known scientist Dr. Dale Buckley of BIO. Thank you. Thank you all.